All right, our recording has started. Welcome, everybody. My name is Sally Olad. I'm excited to have you here with me. I'm also uh, joined by Larry Macharone, and we're going to be talking about moving the needle by measuring what matters. Uh, very honored to have you. Larry's a great friend and somebody I really look up to in the Agile Metrics world, so thank you for being here with us, Larry. Oh, my pleasure, and, and I consider you a great friend also, and a thought leader in this area, too. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. So what we're going to be talking to you guys about today is metrics, metrics, metrics. All of us want to measure uh, the effectiveness of our teams. We want to measure the effectiveness of the transformation. Um, are we achieving the goals? We're spending millions of dollars on this transformation. How do we know that it is hitting the mark? Um, so a lot of what we're going to be covering with you today is what are the right things to measure, uh, to what degree, and how do you really put those three metrics that matter together to tell the story of if your organization and your teams are moving in the right direction? Is it really all just about agile? Should it all be quantitative metrics? Should it be qualitative? Should maturity play an aspect of this? What are the right metrics that matter? So thank you, Larry, for being part of this. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. For those of you that don't know me, I'm originally from Sudan in Africa. Uh, it used to be the largest country in Africa, but as you can see, it got a little split right over there. So we're now South Sudan and North Sudan. Um, and fun fact is I'm actually heading there this Thursday with the family. Uh, so mentally, I'm already kind of um, in that very long trip <laughs> getting prepared. Uh, I'm also a very busy mother of three beautiful, amazing children, Noor, Sharif, and Yara. Uh, so in addition to an entrepreneur, I get to play mom. Uh, from a technical perspective, my background was a software engineer and a developer for many years. I was a web architect both on the Java, the .NET side, fell in love with training and coaching organizations, and then became um, an entrepreneur. Uh, a lot of what I do today is I'm a business agility um, strategist, so I help executives that are trying to build a strategy and a roadmap for a business agility transformation beyond just technology, and I love uh, absolutely doing that, and I've got many awesome people in the company that help. So um, what you might not know about us is there's three different brands we're known for. Agile Transformation is the company I founded back in 2009. Uh, we offer two products, which is the agilevideos.com. It's the largest e-learning library. And Agility Health is our measurement and continuous improvement platform. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Let's go to Larry the man. Hey. Um, so a little bit about my background. I uh, graduated from Virginia Tech with an electrical computer engineering degree. So if there's any Hokies on the line, I, you know, I'm reaching out to you. I started my first business while I was still an undergrad at Tech, grew it to 20 million a year in sales, 80 employees. Our biggest client was actually G GE Power Generation. We wrote the software that controlled the machines that drive the power grid. So writing very high quality software, safety critical, security critical, imagine the bad guys getting control of the power grid. Um, was very important. And, and I think we came up with uh, unique ways, unique practices. This was pre-agile um, of, of writing software. And, and I started talking about that. In the course of uh, that, talking about that and trying to spread these concepts to the industry, I got the attention of some folks at Carnegie Mellon. They invited me to come research, uh, re do, that, do research at Carnegie Mellon, lead a research consortium, um, basically trying to vet out these things. And I, I decided to sell out of my business and do this because I really thought it was important to try to change the way software development was being done in the industry to, to, to do this. So I'll, seven years of trying to accomplish that change the world goal at Carnegie Mellon, I realized that it's really hard to do from academia. Um, the, the, the academic research is, is, is very small scale in a lot of cases and very case uh, study oriented because it's very hard for them to get big data sets. I needed a big data set. And so I gave a talk at the Agile conference in 2009, and, and uh, I got three job offers out of that. And, and the reason I, I left Carnegie Mellon to go to Rally Software is because Rally had this big data set that I thought that if I could crawl around in that data, I could vet out some of these ideas that I've been trying to and get you know, concrete proof of, of the ideas that they work and are effective. And, and that's what I did. So I, I published the largest ever study correlating practices um, with outcomes, with performance. Um, and I created this software development performance index, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit, that, that uh, Sally is, is, is borrowing from or incorporating in, in, in her effort now at, at this point. A um, couple other things before I move on. I, I'm still a hardcore developer. I uh, manage a dozen or so open source projects, one of which gets over 200,000 downloads a month. So 
I'm still very active and relevant to, to talking to developers. I do a lot of work in cybersecurity with Comcast, and I do, I do work with a number of different companies on Agile Metrics, including Agility Health. Wonderful, thank you for being with us. Um, impressive background, definitely. Uh, so I'm gonna share with everybody a little bit of the challenges that we see with transformations um, and how we are attempting to address them. The first challenge I would say is clarity and alignment. Every company wants to transform, um, but I don't think that there's full agreement into so which area or what problem are we trying to transform? What is the maturity roadmap? And do we have a common definition? So just as an exercise, try to ask um, three or four different areas what DevOps means to them, and you'll start to see really conflicting. Well, DevOps means this. Well, DevOps is only from this part to that part. So the, the idea is also ask a whole bunch of Agile coaches, what do you believe makes an Agile team healthy? Or what makes an Agile team you know, mature and high performance? Everybody has an opinion. So um, I think that you'll see that when we design those radars, the first objective that we had is we all have to agree to some level of common definition of what does it look like to mature in a specific area. Even if it's not 100% the right thing, even if it's just 80% there, we'll at least be able to move the needle by having a common definition. The second thing is once you have a common definition of what does it look like to succeed or mature, then you need to start having um, measurement against it, right? Whether it's quarterly, monthly, whatever cadence you want to, and actually measuring the metrics that really matter. I think there's a lot of metrics out there and some of them could really be leading indicators and help you make it um, a difference. And some of them really are just informational and sometimes very lagging. Intentional growth is something I'm very passionate about. It's the whole purpose of Agility Health, which is how do we become really intentional and develop a continuous improvement program where teams and programs and individuals and portfolios have a chance at the end of every quarter to pause for a second reassess themselves, remeasure, re uh, do a retrospective, and then build a real growth plan for change in the next quarter or in the next cycle. Something that I want to pause and talk about here and actually have um, Larry might share uh, an example is if you start taking measurements and metrics and using them to punish or reward, then you'll never see the truth again. Um, the, the goal of metrics should really to be enabling growth and um, helping people get better, helping teams get better. I think um, some of the old school thinking, which is let's just acquire the metrics so that we could rank teams against each other and figure out who's high performing, who's low performing, and maybe reward the managers that have high performing teams. I call that like a rookie mistake from a metric perspective. It's like you don't know what you're doing. You're messing around with the fundamental purpose, which is to help organizations grow. Um, and Larry has some cool examples here. I think one or two stories that you can share about using metrics the wrong way. So let me use one outside of the area of software development and then one inside the area of software development. And first one will be, you know, punish and the second one will be reward. And, and you can go wrong in both, in both directions. That, so that's, that's part of the point here. Um, so you, a number of you probably at some point, if not still today, wear a fitness tracker. Um, little secret I can tell you about these things. If you tie them to the ceiling fan or the puppy dog's tail, you're gonna get a lot more steps in a day. <laughs> so I see some smiles and some giggles from the folks that are, that are muted, uh, you know, cause it, that's funny, it's absurd. That's why it's funny because why would you pay a hundred and some odd dollars for this fitness tracker and look at the metrics on a daily basis just to game it? I mean, you'd be basically defeating the purpose of having the fitness tracker and having these metrics to begin with. But, but the reality is, is that in the corporate world, we do this all the time. We encourage the behavior of gaming the metrics. If, if your boss were to say to you, hey, we're going to reward you for uh, getting 10,000 steps a day, you're going to be highly tempted to, um, so I don't know if we want to answer questions now or hold them for later, but there's Keep going. Questions. Keep going, okay. So well, you're going to be highly tempted to tie it to the puppy dog's tail or throw it in the dryer, dryer to get those steps, those steps every day. Again, defeating the purpose of the metrics in the first place. So even that's a, a reward situation. Um, let me give you a real world punish situation. And this is a very subtle punishment. Um, if you establish control limits on a team's performance cycle time, for instance, and you color code everything that's above a certain level on, in that control limit, um, you color code them red and you show that chart to the whole organization for your team, 
um, you're going to see less red dots the very next time. But, but you may be because the team but thoughtful about how to avoid long cycle times. But in, more, in all likelihood, you'll get less red dots just because they just have decided they're not going to allow their team to show any more red dots. Again, hiding information from you. Um, so I like the idea of a cycle time. I introduced this time and process chart um, uh, to, to basically deal with this problem, still get you the rich information of, a, of, of what's typically put on a control chart in the manufacturing world, but, but not have this punishment aspect to it. So it's much more effective in, in using it. Wonderful. Thank you, Larry. Um, so the, the three things we just talked about is clarity and alignment. So a lot of the times when you see the radars, obviously many of you are already customers of Agility Health, or if you're new, you'll see that we have these different radars. We have the DevOps Health radar. We have the, the Agile Release Train Health radar. We have the Team Health radar, uh, the portfolio. All of those radars are meant to say, look, if this is an area you're trying to transform in or get better, can we at least agree and have clarity and alignment that this is what, these are the competencies, the dimensions, um, and here's the crawl, walk, run, fly in that area. You'll also see with an agility health measurement, so quarter after quarter or whatever your cycle is, by what percent have we improved? And I think that's one flaw that we have right now is we spend a lot of money on our agile transformations, um, but we really can't show ROI or that we really are making things better or improving the needle. Um, and the third thing we talked about is intentional growth. And intentional growth, I'll talk about this towards the end again, is you really should have three backlogs of growth, one at the team level, one at the org level, and one at the enterprise level, and actually have accountability for growth. Growth is not something that just the teams do. It actually is um, most likely something that your management, your leaders um, need to help them with. There are impediments and obstacles that will sit at these multiple levels that need to be addressed by the leadership layer. So when we say business agility, I guess let me take um, this back over here and let Larry kind of walk through some of these. Um, but what does business agility mean to you, Larry, just before I even show you some words here? Yeah, so um, software development, agile movement, really targeted software developers and software development team. When we started rolling that out to development teams, we realized that there were impediments that were outside of the development team that, that really meant that we weren't getting all of the value of the team being able to respond to change more. And so the concept of business agility by some definitions, at least, is, is this broader sort of concept where you want to be able to respond to change in the industry as a whole or, or adapt to, to a change to get alignment. These are the concepts that to me that make up business agility. Yep, wonderful. And so those are the words that we commonly think about is deliver value fast, respond quickly, make sure that we're adaptable, flexible, and lean, lead through uncertainty, make sure that we're disruptive instead of being disruptive, that we could be, um, have disruptive innovation. Instead of just managing through change, it's really about striving um, through uh, change and ambiguity. Dynamic capability is being able to create new capabilities the market needs you to create when they need you to create it. Being very customer focused, being really listening to the voice of the customer, um, and then making sure there's alignment, that everything that the teams are doing is aligned back to an outcome or um, to uh, what the objective was. So I'm gonna take you here just really quickly for those of you that might not have seen this before, but we have, we're known for this enterprise business agility model. And kind of like what Larry just said, um, if you're trying to transform at the business agility level, it's gonna take more than just transforming technology. Uh, so these are the key areas I want you to take away because many of the metrics and the measurement relate to, especially the impediments and obstacles that you're gonna see, relate to one of these things not happening well. And the first pillar is customer seat at the table. And customer seat at the table is really bringing lean product development and lean startup um, to your organization so that you're building the right product for the right customer. You're going to know when you're starting to build so many things and you get defects back or the market's not really, doesn't have penetration and engagement, you're not converting because you really are not building the right product. This is a transformation that's happening right now on the business side. So the product management team, business leaders, are we starting to understand personas and jobs to be done and journey maps? Are we starting to build experiments with MVPs and MMPs? And are we starting to use data to validate our assumptions? 
Lean portfolio management's really around demand and capacity. So a lot of companies are investing in um, visualizing it using portfolio rooms and saying, look, what is our demand, but what is our capacity each quarter? And how do we allow teams to pull? And how do we break down these large epics into quarterly sized outcomes and make sure that our finance has shifted as well? So the reason I'm showing you this is, again, you're going to see a lot of obstacles and impediments that will be raised by the team that fundamentally will point towards a symptom of portfolio management is not lean, your demand is higher than your capacity, and you're pushing too much work and multitasking everybody. Stable teams and structure and design is really around redesigning your teams, whether you're putting program teams and trains above them, whether you're aligning all of them around value streams, how do we make them more stable and less transient? Um, and then the one that's always forgotten is the role of the manager. How do we transition the poor manager, which we've forgotten about, into the new role that they have to play into this world? Communities of practice are going to be critical from a design as well. I'm not going to cover the Agile framework and mindset. This is where we all live. We're very comfortable here. We bring Scrum and Kanban. We learn about scaled Agile or DAD or less. Um, and I think this is kind of where we've stayed for a long time. I'm seeing companies now begin to reorg, redesign, and also bring a little bit more maturity on the left side. My favorite pillar is the leadership and culture, which I would say is lagging. Some companies are starting to invest in leadership and cultural transformation, but this is really for managers, leaders, and executives. How do we teach them this new way of leading? How do we help them move away from command and control to enabling teams to being more strategic and less tactical and knowing how to lead for business agility. Um, the advice that I have for you here is this is a journey. It is not a class. There is no one workshop that will transform your leaders. It is truly something that we've learned takes multiple workshops over time for and assessments and measurements for leaders to begin to shift. And then um, the make it stick pillar is because uh, we've done a lot of transformations and I'm sure you guys can, you know, probably have this experience, but once you turn around or turn away, it doesn't stick. It starts to fall apart. So it's very important that you build internal coaches for whatever customer or within your organization. Continuous measurement and growth is everything Larry and I will be talking about moving forward. And then also think about your agile HR. You're changing the way that we uh, um, reward people from a performance management perspective, but also how we hire them and how we grow them. At the bottom here, we also have the technology transformation, and this is the popular DevOps movement and re-architecting and leaning out and getting more modern systems. So I, I wanted to show you this because even when we talk about metrics, metrics matter because they're helping us do what? And if you are looking for metrics that will help you um, move towards business agility, we need to have a common definition of what does business agility entail and what metrics at what level will tell me I have what problem. So um, I'm going to ask you guys for a quick workshop here. So using your chat, uh, I want you to think about metrics at the team level, at the program or at the portfolio. Go ahead and share what metrics do you think matter? So start it with maybe team level and then give me a name of a metric or program level and then the name of the metric or portfolio. I'm curious to hear what do you have in the back of your mind? What are you tracking today? All right, so those are some good metrics that you guys have shared. Some of them are very team oriented. We've got a couple that are at the program level. Um, so I'm gonna challenge you to think about metrics in three different categories. And then I'm gonna have, um, uh, Larry's gonna jump through and talk about the delivery, the quantitative metrics and how to think about them. But there's really three metrics that matter. Qualitative is really around the team health and maturity. Um, are we behaving? Do we have the right practices? Um, are we achieving the right outcomes? And are we maturing? And so a lot of the crawl, walk, run, fly that I'll share with you comes from are we maturing in whatever area we're trying to grow? It could be agile, it could be DevOps, it could be marketing, it could be sales. Whatever the area is, it's not just limited to agile. Are we maturing? From a quantitative perspective, there's delivery and performance, and Larry's gonna dig into this one in deeper. And then the most important outcome I want you to take out of today, which all of us forget about, unfortunately, is business outcomes. And business outcomes is, are we achieving the results that we wanted to achieve? Um, and the goal of Agility Health as a platform really is for it to be the single source of record for your enterprise teams and then those three metrics that really matter.
one way that we can visualize, and Larry, can you talk about this one just a little bit here? One way to visualize across the across programs, across lines of business, let's just say that C, F, N, R, those are all names of programs. How would you interpret this, um, this design here? Yeah, so two of the dimensions you have shown here, um, the quantitative performance on, and, and qualitative performance on the x-axis and then maturity on the, on the y-axis and where each dot shows up is, is sort of where the, the team in your organization or the groups in your organization fall. I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily a fan of showing team to team comparison visualizations though. I, I would much rather show a uh, single team trending over time, which I think is the, is the next slide here. So, yeah. yeah. And I would actually say on this page, this should be either program F N R O. So program by program or program by program by rather than team by team. Um, so that it's not team by team, but this is just overall. And then the size that you guys see over here is really um, this portfolio or this program is achieving 70% of their outcomes. These folks over here have a smaller circle because they might not even be tracking towards outcomes or achieving them. Um, so this is kind of a way to display all three of them. And this is the one that um, Larry was just talking about, which is the same team or the same program has been trending over Q1, Q2, and Q3. Is that right? Right. So all good visualizations have to answer the question compared to what? And so you're, the first visualization you had compared program to program, this visualization compares your current self to a prior version of yourself. And that those are visualizations that have impact. Awesome. So delivery and performance quantitative metrics, um, take it away. Oh, yeah. So in my intro, I, I, I said that I published the largest ever study correlating practices with performance. Um, and I didn't explain what I meant by performance. So, so when I went to go do this research, you know, I had this database of tens of thousands of teams at Rally, and I, I wanted a way to extract from that database real indicators of performance. And this is a, a tough problem that nobody's gone about in a scientific way in the past. So let me describe to you the scientific way that we went, we went about this. We first brainstormed about what dimensions of performance we thought would be significant. And we came up with eight dimensions. Um, and then we brainstormed, and, and these are broad dimensions like productivity. Um, and then we brainstormed specific metrics within each of those dimensions. And we came up with somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 40 specific metrics for each of these dimensions, or at least the primary four that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and then we calculated all of these metrics for all 10,000 teams over time. And we tried to analyze that. We looked for which metrics were actually indicating different aspects of performance. We used principal component analysis, which essentially measures the orthogonality of the metrics regimen. And, and so that helped narrow the scope down from these 120 or so metrics that we started with down to maybe 40 or so. And then we had teams where we had qualitative insight on all four of these dimensions from, so we tried to figure out which metrics correlated best with the qualitative insight. These are things like ask their manager or their customer how they, how productive the team is, how responsive the team is, how good the quality output of the team is. Um, and so when we did this, we actually came up with a set of five or so metrics that we think really capture the performance of of a team pretty accurately over time. And, and the surprising thing was that, that the set of metrics we ended up with was not the set we would have guessed. Um, so for instance, the concept of velocity, the sum of story points, um, we thought that would be our productivity measure. Turns out it was not our productivity measure. And I think uh, I've got a slide that sort of describes what our productivity measure was coming up. So maybe we can get to that one. Yeah, so let's, let's go. So, so for productivity, rather than um, talk about velocity, we, we, we calculated both velocity normalized in, in five or six different ways and throughput normalized in, in two or three different ways. And um, it turns out that velocity in some cases was slightly better indicator of productivity than throughput, but it was only a slight improvement. And throughput is a much easier metric to count because velocity is a sum of story points. 
which means you have to have starter points to, in the first place. And then you have to figure out a way to normalize those points, which is incredibly troublesome. Um, throughput, however, is just a count of work items. And so Julie's on this, Julia's on this, uh, this call, she'll sort of like this. I, I ended up borrowing a lot of concepts from the Kanban world. That metrics regimen was designed to graft over the top of any process, because Kanban was meant to graft over the top of any process, um, rather than the Scrum metrics regimen. And, and you'll see in, in the other dimension. So let's go to the, the next one. Um, uh, you'll see in, in, in the third one that coming up here, let's go one more, um, this uh, time to value, uh, time in process metric also is very much like cycle time, also comes from, from the Kanban world. Um, so two of the, the metrics came directly from, from the Kanban world. Predictability, once we had our throughput metric, predictability um, was fairly easy. We, we, did, we did analyze some sort of say-do metrics, like, like did the stories that they finished at the end of the sprint match the ones they thought they would at the beginning, or at least the volume of, of, of points or, or stories match. Um, and that was somewhat indicative, but we found that the easiest thing to do would be to just take the last three um, throughput and calculate this thing called the coefficient of variance of throughput. So if you um, do 10 stories one month or one sprint and you do 20 stories the next sprint and you do one story the sprint after that, it's highly varied and you're going to have low predictability. But if you do 10 one month and 12 the next month and nine the next month, that's pretty low variability. And so that became our predictability metric and very easy to calculate. Quality was perhaps the toughest one. And we ended up using two metrics to satisfy this dimension. Um, one is called defect density and the other is defect aging. Defect density is not the traditional definition of defect density, which has line of code count in the denominator. It's got um, team size or the volume of through throughput in the denominator. Um, the numerator is either release defects or defects found dur during development. And aging is similar, except it takes into account how long it takes for the defects to get, to get resolved. I'm curious, um, Larry, did technical debt come up um, and where did it fall in, in any of the priorities? I'm just curious if that was one. Well, remember we were trying to quantify. So, you know, the, the, the idea of technical debt um, is quantifiable in some ways at the code level. It's a little harder to quantify at the architectural level, um, you know, with any sort of data. But if you go to the next slide, I think, um, no, it's two, it's two. So let's skip this one and go, and then we'll come back to this one in a second. So, oh, no, I gotta go one more, I guess. Sorry. <laughs> and we'll, then we'll go back. Because you asked, we came to this. If you look in the lower right-hand corner of this, code quality, um, static analysis and test coverage. So the, this uh, Uncle Bob Martin introduced this metric um, called the CRAP metric, and I can't remember what CRAP stands for, but it was an acronym. Um, and basically the idea here is, is you look at cyclomatic complexity um, and the size of your functions, and that's an indicator of, of large technical debt. And then you look at test coverage. And if you have great test coverage, then you can afford a little bit more cyclomatic complexity or large function size. And so it, it takes both of these dimensions into account, one of the numerator and the denominator. So that would be what I would answer if somebody asks me about technical debt. Okay, awesome. At least that's the only way we can quantify it. There's, there's a qualitative aspect with architecture that we can. So, so these, let's go back. Those are, um, do you want me to go back to the first, the other side? Yeah, yeah. He, All right. There you go. So did that answer your question though? Yes, it did, oh, absolutely. Okay. Cool. Um, so, so we first worked on developing the Software Development Performance Index because we wanted to publish research that correlated practices with performance. So we needed the performance aspect in order to do that. Um, so that was our, our first goal, but, but we didn't stop there. So we ended up using the SDPI for a number of other things. We baked it into the Rally product um, and we published the, the first ever software performance benchmarking um, solution. We created the first, um, so we basically had the data of tens of thousands of teams so we could develop a percentile distribution of which metrics are sort of the top performers. If you get this, this number for this metric, then it's in the, in the top performance. And we could say your team is in the 25th percentile for quality, but you're in the 90th percentile for productivity. 
and, and, and then you could basically decide whether or not that matched your business model. And if you wanted to change it, it would tell you where to focus on. So benchmarking really tells you what to focus on and what to work on. And then the other reason, and this is, this is the part that sort of survives today really strongly in Rally, is um, we really focused on helping teams get feedback for sort of like the Fitbit for you as an individual. We gave the Fitbit for teams to get feedback on their, their performance over time. And, and you can use this for retrospectives and coaching and, and um, uh, very thoughtful improvement activities. Um, so just to tease you a little bit here with the, with the results of that research, um, this is one slide that summarizes, you know, what, what's three years worth of research. So, so I'll, I'll, go, I'll go pretty quickly. But the number one thing teams can do to improve their performance is to lower their whip. Um, so we knew that if you lowered your whip, you would have faster response time. Little's Law predicts that there's sort of a, a linear relationship between response time, uh, cycle time, tip, and um, uh, whip. So if you lower your whip, you'll lower your tip. Tip that stands for time and process. But we didn't know that, we didn't guess that the impact on quality would be even more dramatic than the impact on time to market. So the theory here is that when you have um, controlled whip, then the teams really focus on a few things and they produce a much higher quality product because of that. Um, there is one sort of warning, and this only applies to about 5% of the team's data we looked at, but, but there is such a thing as too low a whip under certain circumstances. You get these better quality, you get this better time to market, but you actually, by lowering your whip, you sometimes empty queues out, and so some, some team members sit idle. And I think this is a contributor to the quality factor. When team members sit idle, they're not really idle. They actually go off and do refactorings and, and think things through and work on things that are sort of coming next design kind of activities. So they're not really sitting idle, but by creating some slack in the system, you actually get less total things done um, in the same amount of time. But again, if, if this is the optimal sweet spot for, for balancing productivity, predictability, quality and responsiveness, then most teams are operating way over here with WIP. And, and you, you have a long way to go before, before you sort of hit this, this productivity problem here. Um, stable teams uh, result in 60% better productivity, 40% better predictability. Um, dedicated teams, um, teams made up of people who only work on one team, um, double their productivity. These, these make sense. These are the Agile recommendations. Um, one thing that deviates from the Agile recommendation, though, is we found that the optimal team size varies widely based upon your context. Um, if you're building um, something that's really unprecedented and you want to do a lot of experiments really rapidly, smaller than a five-person team might actually uh, outperform um, big teams. If you're building medical devices or aircraft controls where safety is critical and you need you need you need design and design review steps in your sprint and and code review steps that are very thorough in your sprint then actually larger teams resulted in better quality and that might be a better choice for your for your context so it depends um, iteration length. Uh, we looked at uh, iteration length and two week iterations is what most coaches recommend that worked out to be the optimal sort of uh, for, for most situations. However, um, longer iterations did correlate with higher quality. So if you're building medical devices, again, or aircraft controls, you might want to consider that. And shorter iterations um, correlated with better productivity and much better responsiveness. So maybe maybe going down in one week might make sense if if, really, if you really want to execute a lot of experiments really fast. Um, so a couple more things that we're gonna, I'm going to talk about. The, the research looked at 50 total findings of, of practices and correlated them with performance. And so this is maybe a dozen or so of the findings from that, from that research. But these are the, the most important ones. One of the really interesting ones that I, I thought was really interesting was the ratio of testers to developers. And, and it, it, it wasn't that interesting in the most obvious sort of findings. More testers led to better quality. There you go. Uh, but more testers also led to better, to worse 
productivity and responsiveness also expected because you got, you know, more people, uh, you know, basically more, more steps to, to have to be done. There. But the really interesting finding, the really interesting result of this, this research was that the teams that self-identified as having no dedicated testers, these are the teams where the whole team essentially claimed ownership of quality. Everyone participated in, in, in um, uh, you know, writing tests or doing manual testing or, or just cared about quality in, in a holistic sense. These teams had um, almost as good a quality as the highest ratio of testers to developers, one to one. Um, they had the best productivity, actually, of all of the groups that we looked at. Uh, there was a wide, wider variation, though, in this. The upper quartile of this group had the absolute best quality, but the lower quartile actually had worse quality. So there's some teams that say, oh, we don't need any testers. We're just going to do it as a team holistically, but they don't actually really take that to heart. That was the lower quartile, but the, the upper quartile is, are the example of the teams that really took it to heart and the whole team took ownership of quality. Um, I think there's one more here. Yeah, so no, this is just sort of a tease about some of the, the other things I found in that research. This research is called The Impact of Agile Quantified. If you Google my name and, and that title, Impact of Agile Quantified, you'll, you'll find uh, links to video recordings of the whole, of the whole deck. So you're going to actually solve the big Kanban versus Scrum debate? You've got some data on this? Do you want me to spill the beans on that one here? So spill spill the beans. Let's do it. I'm okay. so Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, guys, just so you know, I'm neutral. I think every one of them has a place. I'd love to hear what the data says. Well, you know, it, there was no clear winner in the traditional sense of comparing Kanban teams to Scrum teams. They had roughly the same performance. Scrumbon okay. teams had slightly better performance, but it, you know, it wasn't a big deal. The really interesting thing about this research though, was that teams that switched from Kanban to Scrum showed huge improvements in performance and teams that switched from Scrum to Kanban also showed huge improvements in performance. So what this tells me is that you have to fit it to your context and the teams that made the switch made the switch because the new, they, they, they qualitatively decided that the new process type was a better fit for their context and they reap the rewards of that. So, so that's sort of a teaser, not, there's not, I don't really solve the question of that, but I, I think the finding is really, is really still very interesting. Awesome, wonderful. Um, so we started on this slide a little bit ago in the lower right hand corner. I said there were eight dimensions of performance. We've only talked about the, the one in the lower right hand corner from this slide, plus four others, productivity, predictability, quality, responsiveness. Um, and the reason we focused on those is that those are the ones we could extract from the rally data. But that doesn't mean that they're a holistic view of performance. And that, you know, in order to get a holistic view of performance, you need to have these other four dimensions at least. And, you, and, you know, Sally would add uh, uh, um, maturity and, and a few other things, leadership. And, and I agree with all of those as well. But these were, the, these were the additional four that we couldn't get at when I was at Rally. Um, customer stakeholder satisfaction. The best way to do that is an MPS survey. Um, employee engagement or satisfaction. The best way to do that is sort of a happiness survey or an engagement survey. Although I actually don't think you get as much value out of a 13 question engagement survey um, as, you, as it costs you in terms of the burden on your employees to answer a 13 question survey. I think you get almost as much value out of simply doing an MPS question to your, to your employees. Um, and then the holy grail of all agile metrics or at least software agile metrics is the build the right thing metric. Um, it's traditionally very hard to, to measure though there are some folks that have made huge strides in these areas though recently. Pendo um, is a, you know, someone I also work with, a friend of mine um, is, the, is the founder of Pendo, uh, Todd Olson. Um, and, he, and I did some work with them to analyze their data sets. Um, and engagement metrics, the ratio of weekly users to monthly users, churn metrics, uh, uh, annually recurring revenue metrics, how those are trending. These are all sort of ways to figure out whether your product is a is a good fit for the market. Um, it's, they're pretty lagging indicators in some cases. I did find a few 
leading indicators though um, in that research. And I'm glad to talk to you, um, uh, when you, if, you have, if you have questions about that. Um, yeah, so I think we had, had uh, we were gonna skip this slide, Sally, but, but uh, you know, since it's up, I, I'll, I'll just sort of briefly touch on it. Um, percentiles are sort of the way I like to express this information. It, it's much more useful to someone to say, you're in the 25th percentile of all the speakers that spoke at this last conference than to say, your score was 4.2 out of average, right? The 4.2, I don't know what that compares to. Were, were the good speakers 4.1 or were the good speakers 4.9? By saying my, my talk was in the 25th percentile, I answer the question compared to what? And so that's really what percentiles are targeting is answering that question. Awesome, that was really, really good. Um, and I'm gonna just show visually here just some of the, the, the quantitative metrics that we track within Agility Health. Um, and so for every team, um, once they do their qualitative measurement with their team health radar or the DevOps or whatever their maturity radar is, on the same page, you can start to look at some of the hard metrics that are there. The only one that we're adding right now that isn't there is the feature cycle time. Um, and we will be probably adding additional ones that were, we don't want to add everything here because I really believe you should go back to your ALM um, tool to really understand the deeper um, qualitative metrics, uh, quantitative, but we are pulling just a few. We integrate right now with um, Jira Rally version one and HP, um, I should say CA, not Rally, but, uh, but we integrate with them just to pull some just enough metrics so that we can tell you the full story. Because we really believe if you're only looking only at quantitative, but you're not looking at qualitative and business outcomes together, you're not seeing the full picture to enable growth. So I'll skip some of these slides. These are just samples of what you can see within Agility Health. Um, and let's go to qualitative. So from a maturity perspective, as Larry just mentioned, um, yes, we care a lot about the team health and maturity. And we believe that that's really found in terms of, does the team have clarity on their vision, their plans and their roles? Does the team actually perform? And we do check for some of that qualitative confidence. Uh, does the product owner have confidence in the current goals and deliverables? Does the team have confidence? And then do the people outside of this team, their stakeholders, do they have confidence? Um, from a measurement perspective, and I'm actually, just in case this is too small, I'm gonna go into the bigger version so you can see it. But from a measurement perspective, um, do we believe that we have predictability? Are we improving time to market? Um, do we have value delivery? Is quality improving and are we responding to change? So these are ones that we care a lot about because everybody who moves to Agile says we're moving to Agile to optimize some of these metrics that are here. Um, from a leadership perspective, I think leadership is critical. Uh, you, you won't see a team that's healthy and high performing if the people around the team are not supporting them. And so we ask about the, obviously the scrum master or the facilitator, the technical leads, the product owner, but also the manager of the team. Uh, they can make or break a team. So even though I know they're not part of a team or core member, but they really have such a high impact. The culture, which is the happiness score. So this is one question around, would you love to work here or would you rather work somewhere else? And then some of the other things about trust and respect and the, also the foundation and the team structure. And I think Larry alluded to some of them in terms of the allocation and stability and the size and the skills and how those impact. So all of these, this kind of gives you a visual way to say, so from a qualitative perspective, how are we doing? Um, and we also believe that you should have all these questions right now for us are crawl, walk, run, fly. Um, and so give, give the team a way to understand what does great look like and what does not so good look like, but also give them a way to learn themselves. One of the things I'm a big um, advocate of is enabling teams to self learn um, because teams are not always going to have an agile coach present. So how do I help my teams help themselves when they're not doing so great in a specific area? What does healthy look like? What does unhealthy look like? And what are some real recommendations that they can be going to pull in? Um, or request a coach to come help them. Um, so the, and this is just a sample of the crawl, walk, run, fly model, which is for team health. We obviously have a maturity roadmap, but we've realized that we actually are now creating a maturity roadmap um, for, you know, DevOps, for leadership, for the transformation itself. I think it helps people get on the same page when they can say, this is how we are going to get better. Whether it's 100% accurate or not or right, it's not about that, it's really about consensus on, do we agree that these are the steps that we're gonna to take to move the needle? And business outcome is something I'm very passionate about. I've been uh, talking about this quite a bit and we have a new workshop that we're doing related to this. 
for our customers. Um, and it really is around as teams and programs and portfolios, how can we become less deliverable focused and more outcome and results focused? So for example, in this case, and we're using a, um, a format here called an OKR, which is an objective and a key result, but I've also added to the OKR what we call the hypothesis statement that comes from lean um, and from experimenting a lean startup. So we want to increase customer conversion. To do that, uh, we believe that by improving the usability of the product search and browse page on our website, we will increase conversions from shopping cart to the checkout. And some of the key results that we could um, gain here is increase the checkout conversion. Right now, 50% of the people that add something to their cart actually check out. We want it to be 70%. Um, and who's going to own that number or own measuring it is marketing. But we also want to reduce the time to find the relevant product. We believe that this is the impact metric. So if you guys have um, read a little bit about Jeff Patton's work around um, output, outcome, and impact. Output is a lot of what we've been focusing on in Agile. It's more deliverables than output. We're just getting work done. Outcomes are something similar to this, reducing time to find a relevant product. I think this is a great outcome, and we can achieve this outcome at the end of our release in December. An impact is something that we're getting a little bit of time, because impact usually means that we've made a difference in the market, either for our customers, we've moved the NPS score, we've moved their engagement, if you guys are familiar with the um, pirate metrics, the activation, acquisition, retention, referral, revenue, um, we've made a, a, a bottom line impact in any of those. So that's why you see it with this notation. Um, and so for this level of effort, well, the Baca team has committed that they'll help us do this. It's going to take them eight weeks. We're estimating a week of $20,000 cost. That tells me that this outcome is going to cost me $160,000. And the estimated ROI from this outcome from a marketing perspective, they said we should um, have half a million dollar increase um, in revenue because of this 70% um, checkout instead of the 50. So um, one aha that we have realized, and that's why we built the workshop, is people don't know how to do this very well. And I think just like we focus so much on story writing and how do we break down features uh, epics into features, into stories. Uh, we've basically designed an entire workshop to help portfolio leaders and program leaders learn how do you take that large scale epic in your mind that's an impact and break it down into outcomes that could really be divided at the team level, at the program, and at the portfolio, and only start tracking these outcomes. Um, and the general sense of is, is three to five per quarter, really. Uh, so you really can't have a lot of noise. You can't have 100 or 20 or 30. It's only three to five outcomes per quarter that a team or a program or a portfolio could focus on. So as we wrap up our time together, I wanted to sort of all bring it, to, uh, bring it together. So remember we showed you how do we bring these three metrics and begin to visualize them. Um, and so think about, again, I want to see the maturity of my organization, whatever this program is. I want to see their performance. And so crawl, walk, run, fly. Uh, based on all these metrics that Larry just talked about, what would be my calculation, my final formula? And that's something that we're working on and building right now with an agility health so that we can display this to you. Are you overall now in a crawl, walk, run, fly based on those metrics that matter from a performance and from a maturity? And then also from a business outcome perspective, how can I see what percent of my business outcomes I've achieved? Um, and remember, in terms of the percentages, it's this number over here. So if I have two key results and I'm 60% through one of them and 20% through the other, the average is 40%. So I am overall at 40% potentially um, uh, completion with this specific objective. The other thing that people want to know is for leadership foundation culture, they also want to know maybe I'm at 60%, but by what have I improved? Um, and it's kind of that other model that uh, Larry showed is quarter after quarter, am I getting better compared to what I was before? It's that compared to what question. Um, I also want to leave you from a continuous improvement uh, with this model to think about, um, which is if you want to be intentional about improvement and growth, think about a backlog at the team level. So every quarter, um, it's a really great kind of, it's a great growth iteration or sprint, which is really three months. Uh, the teams would go through a retrospective and build a growth plan for what they want to improve in the next cycle, the next PI, the next release. If there's something that's blocking them that they cannot resolve, they would raise that up and call it an organizational item. And this is where we really taught advocating creating something called a growth leadership team. And the growth leadership team at the program level, at the portfolio, 
they're made up of your coaches and made up of your managers, and their job is to remove these obstacles from the team. If they are stuck and they cannot resolve this issue, then they would also label it as an enterprise. And this is where senior leaders need to roll up their sleeve and begin to look at the enterprise um, growth items and actually do something about them. So an example of enterprise growth item is the funding model. When you know that your teams are funded in a way that's not very agile friendly, there is no program or growth leadership team can resolve that. That's something at the highest level. So we always say obstacles flow from the bottom up, outcomes flow from the top down. So outcomes are defined at the highest level and they are translated until they reach the team and the team can be aligned completely on which outcomes they are performing. And so, um, and that is why we really have a huge focus on the three metrics that matter and making sure that within Agility Health, we're tracking all three of them to tell you the full story. If you are new to Agility Health, go online, agilityhealthradar.com. You can watch the three minute explainer or you can contact us, we can give you a demo to learn more about it. Um, and this is just the, uh, what is Agility Health? It really is a measurement and continuous growth platform and it's designed to help you accelerate um, and grow from a business agility perspective. Um, there's four things that we can help you with if you're interested, uh, both Larry and I, um, if we have time and, and if it's availability, we'd love to do a consultation around your measurement. What are your goals and how do you want to expose measurement beyond just the team level? How do you want to look at your enterprise measurement? Uh, one project we're working on right now is providing a baseline health assessment across all the teams, agile or DevOps or non-agile. I think sometimes we get too hung up on only measuring the agile teams are not realizing the organization's bigger than that. So how do we come up with something that gives us a baseline across all of them? Um, for new customers, again, happy to give you an overview of Agility Health, or if you're interested in the business agility model, how do we grow from a business agility and how do you gain some maturity around those seven pillars that I mentioned at the beginning? There's the Building Measurable Business Outcome Workshop. That's a one-day workshop. It really is designed for product managers, vice presidents, leaders, and product owners, so they can begin to write. And I would recommend to do that before you have um, a release or a PI planning as a way to come in a little bit more prepared with outcomes for the teams. And again, if you like this seminar, uh, we're more than happy, whether it's Larry and I together or alone, to do this again for your executive group. Here's some contact information. Well, um, I'll pause and take questions at this time, uh, but you can feel free to download this seminar from the uh, Bitly, the Agility Health Seminar. You can use Larry and Sally's code uh, if you wanna get a discount. And this is my contact information and Larry's contact information. Thank you guys so much for being here. Larry, any final words to the team before we take questions? Um, no, th th this is great. I already see some questions I can, I can start to answer though, if you want me to grab the first oh, one off the top. Yes. I haven't read them, so um, yeah, so, so Julia asks, um, she says question for later, but I'm going to do it now, Julia. Okay. So that, that's the kind of service we're providing today. Yeah, um, time, team yeah. metrics, does it support throughput if you don't do story points? Yeah, so, so one of the advantages of, of a throughput metric is that it's just the count of a particular kind of work item, stories or defects or features or epics or themes or whatever you want to call them. Um, it's just a count of them that you get done in a given time frame. Now, there is an assumption that they're all, you know, sort of within, you know, striking distance of each other in size. If one is 100 times bigger than another, then they're really not at the same granularity. So they shouldn't be the same kind of entity in all likelihood. But it's possible, I guess. And so this falls down in those places. But what we found, especially with stories, is that teams gel towards the vast majority of their stories being two or three point stories. And, and so the size that, you know, you break them down until they're sort of, you know, nice uh, sort of small chunks and counting them is just as effective then. And you don't have to worry about having story points for everything. As a result of that. Does the agility health radar that the dashboard that was shown, does that support um, yes, throughput? Okay metrics for the team you can toggle between call points or throughput so when you toggle to throughput then that display changes and the, the rally solution was the same way as it you know i productivity measure there were 12 different options for that in the rally tool and and you know through the velocity was one and throughput was another so yeah other questions and you guys can unmute yourself if you want to if you want to speak 
Do we get any more in the chat? Um, yeah, there's uh, Julia again. Um, what did it say about iteration? Oh, you can skip that one. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. I Randy's got a code. Yeah, got <laughs> Randy's got a question. Uh, I can I can speak to it as well. Hi, okay, go ahead, Randy. Hey, hi everyone. Hey, um, and I think I think we can all relate to this, and this is maybe just for a brief conversation. But we, you know, it, it's as I state here, kind of, you know, how do we crack the code where you know we run into our stakeholders being too busy running the business, and you know, as we talk about getting them to really subscribe to a growth leadership team, for example, as you spoke about, or or you know, really engaging in kind of an EBA program, and enterprise business agility program, just just trying to think through how do we get that initial engagement so that they really see that value, really want to be part of it, really willing to commit themselves to that. And I know we talk a lot, a lot about this in our agile community, um, but just it's just a constant thing that, you know, we're trying to crack that code to get that kind of engagement because we have to have it. Yeah, and I'll, honestly, Randy, my opinion on this one is it's kind of like trying to do a whole agile transformation bottom up. We've done that before, right? Where it's just the teams that do Agile, and then we slowly try to get people to engage. And that doesn't work out very well when your executives and your leaders don't know what you're doing. They don't understand the why, and they're not pushing for it. They're not supporting it. They're not engaging with it. It is the same exact thing with continuous improvement. So I, I almost could think that they're very, very similar in that you're bringing something that's new, new behavior, new practices. You're saying there's a backlog of growth that all of us need to commit to. You're saying that managers and leaders shouldn't be just, you know, putting out fires randomly in different places, but they themselves should form a team. They should have a backlog. They should go through agile practices and have a stand up. Managers should demo to the teams what obstacles they're removing for them. That is completely new, just as new as agile was. So I, I would say that the same effort that it took to make sure that people are educated on Agile and why should we come to a daily stand-up or a sprint or a retrospective is the same effort that it will take top-down to get people excited about continuous improvement and program. Um, you can do only so much at the coach level, but if the product owners, if the senior leaders, if the managers don't have an aha around what this can do for them, um, and what it can do is it can double their velocity or their throughput, right? It could dramatically improve their quality. It's helping them do what they do be you know, better and faster. So it can have a significant impact from a, a growth and um, speed to market and all of those things. But they have to pay it attention. And the ones that have done it well are the ones where the leaders, they really advocated for continuous improvement. They, they um, communicated to everybody. They sent emails. They talked to people. They showed up and showed what obstacles they removed, what issues they found in the last quarter, and how they hold themselves accountable. So it's a lot of education and awareness because you're changing behavior. Yeah, and, and I, I think what, what kind of just struck me as you were speaking there was this, this kind of shift from that command control to servant leadership. And I think that that, that has to start happening too. To, so to kind of adopt a lot of what you're saying, they have to really shift to that servant leadership mindset. And, and that could, that, that's a big leap as well, but obviously very critical to, to everything. But, and that's why it's part of the pillars. All of those things need to happen, unfortunately, around the same time. We have to invest in, and I think what people are doing right now is just bringing agile and DevOps practices, but everything else stays the same. The leadership yeah. style, the way people work, the way they're structured, that's not really going to work. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for all that. It's great seeing everyone on this call. It's group yeah. people I've worked with before. It's an awesome group of people here. Well, well thanks for joining us. It's been a yeah. pleasure having you. Yeah. Okay. Actually, uh, Sally, um, um, I use the uh, Agility Health Raiders uh, for several teams to identify some uh, independence, uh, impediments. Sorry. Um, and I talked to the transition board. That's the, the MT board of the company who said we are changing to uh, being agile or doing agile, whatever. Um, and I said, yeah, but then you have some on your scrum board. So we now call it scrumming scrum uh, because they were a way of all the teams who do actually uh, performing scrum. Um, so I introduced to them the scrumming uh, scrum because then they have to know what is scrum about and we have a weekly um, heartbeat so every week we have to set up with the whole MT board and say this is the impediments of for the teams how do you deliver uh, how do you remove them or let them remove them 
but actually you're in control and not the teams because they're very um, independent from you guys. So we know uh, we call it Scrum of Scrum. Wonderful. No, I mean, just being intentional about that forming as a team and saying, if, you know, the funniest thing is when managers say, I don't have time for this. It's like, okay, yeah. hold on one second. You do not have time to remove obstacles that your teams are saying directly impact their performance, then what do you have time to do? I mean, that is, that is the role of managers and leaders. So thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. All right, everybody, we're at time. I'm gonna stop the recording right now. Thank you everybody for joining.